All right, everybody. So this is our next lesson. We're going to cover two big areas today. We're going to cover something called the tennis court oath, and we're going to cover this thing called the fall of the Bastille. So where we left off last time, we were talking about the three estates and why the taxes were not fair before the outbreak of the French Revolution. So we saw that the king was taking advantage of the regular people and the people were sick of it. So by the end of this notes section, you want to be able to explain what the tennis court oath was and then the king's response to it. So that'll be our first learning goal we want to cover. So, you know, in 1789, Louis the 16th, the king, he started to see that his power was crumbling around him. So he ends up calling a meeting of the estates general, which we remembered was that triangle shaped uh, picture that showed the first estate, second estate and third estate. And we remember that the first and the second estate had all the power and the third estate, which made up 98% of the population had no power, but they paid all the taxes. So leading up to this meeting, the common people all over France, both in the farms and the city, they were dying and they were being taxed to death. So they were having to pay so much of their income each year to taxes and they had no wealth. So they had no way to survive. And so this hatred continues to grow towards the elites and the king because there's a famine, there's no food, everything. So the first time, this was the first time that a meeting had been called since 1614. So it's 1789 now. So since 1614, this was the first time a meeting of the estates general had been called by the king. So the king called all three estates together to help decide how to raise taxes to save France since his kingdom was broke. So literally, France had no money. They were out. They had helped fund the American Revolution. They had had the king spend lavishly. He was you know, by spending money left and right, but now they were broke. And so the king decided, hey, we're going to have to raise taxes again on the third estate. Sorry, that's just how it is. I mean, the third estate this time refused to go along. They had finally had enough, so they refused to pay more taxes. And so this was the first time that any of the third estate had ever stood up to the king and told him no. And so that was an act of power just in itself that had never been seen before. So the third estate stood up to the king and said, nope, we're not doing it. And so at, a, at these meetings of the estates general, they would vote by having the first and second estate vote first, and then the third estate could vote. So that was kind of the order of how they would vote. So why would this be an issue, you think? So this would prevent the third estate from ever having a voice because the first and the second estate would always end up passing everything that they wanted. And then by the time it would get to the third estate to get to vote, the votes would have already been met. They would already have the majority. So the third estate never had a voice in any of this. So they could never say no to anything. And so we move on to the National Assembly. So the third estate had finally had enough and they left the Estates General and created their own body, their own group called the National Assembly. So they finally had enough of the Estates General, they left and they formed this thing called the National Assembly. And so this assembly created a list of issues that they believed needed to be fixed. It was like their grievances. And the first grievance or issue was that all three estates had equal right to vote on laws. So they believe that every single estate, first, second, and third, should have an equal say-so in making laws. And as you can pretty much expect, Louis XVI, he responded by rejecting all the decisions of the third estate. He said, nope, not going to happen. Sorry. And he did so because he saw that his power was crumbling, and he knew that this third estate was a threat to his power. So he knew that this third estate was a threat to his power. And so he ended up locking all the members of the National Assembly out of any meetings of the Estates General. So no members of the Estates General had, were able to be in the hall to vote on any matters now because they were locked out. And so 
in response, the members of the Third Estate and the National Assembly, or also known as the National Assembly, they met on a tennis court. So this moves on to the tennis court oath. So the members of the National Assembly believed that no one had the right to prevent them from voting. They said, no, you can't just keep us from voting just because we don't agree with you. And so since they were locked out of the meeting of the Estates General, they met on a tennis court, a literal tennis court, which back then it was actually inside, but yeah, it was still a tennis court. And they swore to stand together against the king until changes were made. So this oath that they made on the tennis court was that they would not give in to the king unless their demands are met. So they were going to keep fighting until all of their demands are met. So as you can pretty much expect, we see this back and forth between the assembly making a demand, the king responding, the king res making a demand, the national assembly responding. So it's like back and forth. It's like negotiations almost. And so we see the king responded by once again rejecting all the decisions that were made by the National Assembly. And so he's once again said, nope, not happening. Because he believed that he alone could decide what was good for the people and that they should just go back to the way things were. So the king, he thought that since he was so special and such an absolute ruler that he could just tell him, nope, not going to happen. I know what's best for you. And you should just go back to the way things were. That's how naive he was. I guess he really believed that he could just say, no, nope, we're going to go back to the way things were and everybody was just going to be okay. But the National Assembly refused that. Because the National Assembly, their response was, hey, no, we believe that the only people we answer to are those who elect us. So they're like our representatives, a version of our representatives today. And so they believe that they were the only ones the only people that they actually answered to, they didn't answer to the king, they answered to the people who elected them to come to the meeting. And so overwhelmingly, they rejected the king's orders. They refused to go back to the way things were. And this, the big effect that, dro that drove this uh, response from the National Assembly was speeches. So we don't think about today, I guess we don't think about how powerful someone speaking can be. Because, you know, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got YouTube, we've got videos. Back then, they didn't have any of this. So the ability for someone to get up in front of thousands of people and speak and gain their trust and gain their backing, that was major. And so the king never took advantage of that because he refused to address the common people, as he called them. He thought that that was below him. He thought that that was, you know, the king doesn't talk to the to regular people. So instead, the members of the National Assembly, they used the ability to, pe to speak. They used their speeches as a tool to win over the people of France to their side. So they would be meeting in these parlors or these um, kind of like a, a, like our version today of like a coffee shop or on the corners of the street or at people's houses. They would have these huge speeches where they would talk about what was going on. It was kind of like the newspaper almost or like a talk show. So they would have these meetings and they would give these great, wonderful speeches to win over the people to their side and convince them that what they were doing was right. So this is the end of our first section that we're gonna cover. We talked about the National Assembly and the Tennis Court Oath. But now we're gonna move on to being able to explain the first turning point of the French Revolution. So we see that the French Revolution overall is, you know, just, uh, there's different major mo moments. We've talked about the Tennis Court Oath. We've talked about the Estates General. We talked about the National Assembly. Now we're going to talk about this first turning point. So this first major shift in who's in control, you could say. So it's kind of like in a football game where it's back and forth and the first team to score, they, they're ahead. And then they, let's say they stay ahead the whole game until two minutes left in the fourth quarter. They score, another team scores on them and goes for two and gets it and the scores eight, seven now with two minutes to go. That's a turning point, a big shift in power. So anyway, this first 
uh, section we're going to talk about is July 12th through 13th, 1789. So over the course of those two days, a lot happened. So there were rumors of a military overthrow that drew masses of people into a frenzy almost throughout Paris. So Paris is the capital of France and the largest city in France. There were millions of people living in Paris at this time. So there was rumors going around that the military was ready to overthrow the um, National Assembly. And so this drew massive amounts of people and protesters that were coming and they were in a frenzy. They were ready to fight. They were like, no, this is not happening. We're sick of it. Kind of like massive protest movements we see today. Hmm. So these massive protests of people started to surround the soldiers and uh, small gunfights started to break out over the course of two days. So there were small little gunfights and fights and battles here and there all over Paris for the course of two days. And the majority of protesters spent this time gathering weapons because they knew a fight was going to happen. They knew a big battle was going to break out at some point. So we get to July 14th, 1789. This is the fall of the Bastille. And so, we see finally all these thousands of protesters finally make their move. They start to march on the, they start to march on the Bastille and they had actually attacked the Bastille. So they had all these weapons they've been building up for a while and they attacked the Bastille. But before we get to that, we got to talk about who exactly the protesters were. So the protesters were the common people. They were the normal everyday people, the farmers, the workers, the poor, the middle class, the everybody. They were just the common people. They were the middle class, the working class, kind of like today, crazy. And so the Bastille, as we remember from our, from our first ever assignment about the French Revolution, it's that big prison that ended up holding, holding a lot of prisoners who spoke out against the king. So it held prisoners and it was a warehouse to store weapons. So there was a ton of weapons and cannons and bombs and all that that were held at the Bastille. And so after hours of fighting, the army, you know, the, finally the battle breaks out. They're shooting back and forth. The cannons are shot back and forth. And after hours of fighting, the army finally surrendered the castle. So the protesters were able to take control of the castle. This was major, this was huge. Nothing like this had happened before. And so the news of this attack and this desire for a revolution, so an overthrow, a major overthrow, it started to spread throughout France. So this news kind of spread like rumors throughout France. And so this fall of the Bastille is what's considered the first turning point of the French Revolution. So thinking back to our learning goal, we wanna be able to explain the first turning point of the French Revolution. But that's great. We know that it's the turning point. We know the Bas attack on the Bastille is a turning point. But why? Why did they, first off, why did they attack the Bastille? Why did this attack even happen? So the lower class was inspired by these major changes going on around the country. We had the National Assembly demanding changes and demanding more equality. And they were also angry over the fact that the National Assembly, while they were demanding changes, they weren't major, major, major changes that gave equality to everybody. It was kind of like these slow little small changes. So they were saying, well, the National Assembly, why are y'all slowing down this pace of change? We could make some major changes to society overall and not just small little tiny changes. And so, they thought that the National Assembly wasn't going as far as they could to make changes for everybody. They were just making small changes for certain groups of people. And so the lower class believed that the changes should completely alter French, French society and not just small changes here and there. So they believed that it should completely radically shift the society to make everyone have equal opportunities. Crazy concept, I know. But so that's why this attack happened. So that's great. Now we see why they were so enthused to want to go and attack the Bastille. So why was it a turning point then? Why was this a turning point and not uh, some other movement? Or why was this so special, in other words? 
So it was a turning point because capturing the Bastille, it showed that it was not just going to be some small change in like how the voting order. So it wasn't just gonna be changes where, oh, well, I guess the third estate can vote second or something like that. No, it was something much larger that would hopefully change French society and make life more fair and equal for everyone. So pretty much the lower class believed that they had a real shot at having more wealth. So they had a better shot at having more wealth and having more of a say-so in their own lives. And it wasn't the starting point or the final product of the revolution. It wasn't like the very beginning of the revolution. It wasn't the final ending, you know, happy ending of the movie, so to speak. But it was a mo moment where the 98% of people who have been ignored that for centuries, they finally rose up and demanded not only that their voice be heard, but demanded that they be allowed to take part in the changes that are happening. So they weren't just happy that changes were happening. They wanted to be able to have a say so and be involved. So they didn't want just the elites being able to make to be in charge of the changes and them just get to watch it happen. The 98%, the working class, the lower class, they demanded that not only their voice be heard, but to be able to actively take part in it. They didn't want to just watch. They wanted to be hands-on and in charge too. And so this demanding to be heard and being allowed to take place not only rejected the king's absolute power, so the, ability, so the king thought, you know, up until then, everybody thought that they couldn't question the king. So not only did this reject that, but it also forced the elected officials to actually listen to what the people wanted. So those who were elected actually had to listen to the will of the people who elected them to be there. Crazy concept even more. Because, you know, God forbid that happened today. But anyway, so the overall, when the masses of protesters of people that they captured that castle, it helped to make sure that this period of change would not just be small changes but it was gonna be a massive change that would make society more equal, hopefully. So overall, people really truly believe that this was going to be a major shift in how people lived their lives and had opportunities. But last little section, like all revolutions, they end up mostly coming up short. And there's a lot of places where it didn't. And we're going to see how it's going to kind of devolve from here. But following the fall of the Bastille, there was a lot of energy and agreeing that major changes were needed. So after the fall of the Bastille, everybody was unified and wanting to make major changes, you know, uh, all across the, that 98% of people that had been forgotten about for so long and, you know, oppressed for so long, there was that agree that changes need to be made. But the third estate, where it came up short, was that the third estate still accepted the leadership of the elites to guide the revolution instead of actually representing themselves. So the third estate, they claimed like they really wanted to have this power, but that never actually came to be. It never happened. And so the elites only allowed some the right to vote. And they still allowed the king to reject any laws he didn't like for up to two years. So the elites, while they claimed to be all for the revolution, their actions said something totally different. And we see that it didn't really, they ended up kind of siding with the king. And so we get to our last section where it's called the unity ends. So this alliance, these people working together actually ends. So even though they still had control over so much, the elites were still angry over what they saw as the loss of their privileges. So God forbid they saw that they were going to have to actually start paying taxes. Huh, crazy. Probably more than 750 bucks. But anyway, um, the elites planned with the king. They met and they planned with the king, so King Louis XVI, and the other kings around Europe to have what was known as a counter-revolution. So a counter-revolution to stop changes that were taking place. So we saw the revolution happening. So major changes were, stop, were going to start. But we see that this counter-revolution stopped those changes. So they, the king was actively working with the elites and other kings around Europe 
to try and stop these changes from happening. And so the common people also were angry over the fact that their conditions had not improved at the level that they expected to happen. So while changes were happening, it wasn't at the pace that the common people believe should. So they believe that if they didn't radically do something to continue the revolution, then they would just be left behind and forgotten about. And so we're about to see in our next lesson that the revolution is going to take a lot more violent turn. And this is where we've heard about the guillotine and the reign of terror is going to take place. So there's going to be even more radicalization of the French Revolution coming up. So be prepared to have a couple of discussion questions in class, and we will answer the summarizer together in class the next time we meet. But I hope you enjoyed this, and let me know if you have any questions.